Hi everybody, this is Philip Martin, and this is on film for May 6, 2022, which is a science fiction year and doesn't exist. <laughs> uh, what to do today? Well, one thing I want to get to today is I want to talk about, or just mention, all the great stuff that's on television right now. I mean, we just finished up Apple TV Severance, uh, and we we're almost finished up with Slow Horses, the uh, Gary Oldman uh, sort of CD spy series. Uh, I think I've got one more episode of Killing Eve in the Hopper. Um, Better Call Saul is back with uh, my favorite, Kim Wexler. You know, I mean, Rhea Seahorn. I can't wait to see how that story, you know, wraps up in this because she doesn't appear in Breaking Bad. Uh, there's just so much. I mean, it's just... <laughs> Well, Ozark is back, and I'm going to watch Ozark to the end, even though you can make an argument that Ozark's not very good. There's still really good performances in Ozark. Um, and and there's the other things are just falling by the wayside. The Gentleman Jack series, which I enjoyed from HBO, it's back too. So, you know, all of a sudden, you know, we have all this stuff that just comes rushing at us. And I don't know how people keep up. I do not know. I used to wonder... Back in the days when I used to go to uh, film junkets and I would meet other members of my ilk uh, at these junkets. And they were all into like um, not just not just network TV shows and cable TV shows or whatever, not just whatever was going on in the culture. But they were into the gossip, into, you know, uh, the, e the, the EW uh, stuff, the... E channel stuff and they I mean they really just lived into this stuff and I I've never been that way it's sort of like um, I see a lot of movies and un, you know doubtably I see a lot of movies and these days I've been seeing a lot of what I would call well, what Bill Simmons on the ringer podcast called prestige TV I mean I don't really look at it as prestige TV I look at it as good TV but you know um, I see a lot of that but I'm not terribly hip with all the pop culture stuff. I mean, um, flight attendants back too. Yeah. Uh, but I don't recognize people from like their popular TV shows. Uh, I don't. <laughs> and it's sort of embarrassing sometimes because I have my own silo that I have built and that I live in. And I suspect most of us are like that. And most of us have this combination of things that we pay attention to, maybe sports, maybe video games, maybe music. Um, I don't pay attention to, to new music anymore. I mean, I pay attention to what comes across my desk and what grabs my ear. I don't pay attention to what's in the music um, journalism stuff. I don't, uh, you know, I don't read any of the magazines anymore. I mean, I will if I'm looking for something specific, but... I see how you become your parents really quickly and how you have to, or you don't have to, but if, if you want to stay alert to the culture, you really have to work at it. And I'm able to stay alert in some fields. I mean, it's sort of like, um, I pay attention to the movies. I pay attention to prestige TV. And I pay attention to those artists, uh, the recording artists uh, and musicians that I want to. I mean, I really like wet leg. That's new. That's not hard to do, but that's probably passe by now. So anyway, it just keeps flying past us. I've been thinking about that lately because, you know, sort of, you know, we've been, we've had this sort of enforced house arrest for these last couple of years, and we are starting to come out of it now. I uh, actually went out and played a show, uh, not, you know, just a songwriter's um showcase thing. I went out and played one of the song songs writer showcase things, which is the first time I've been on a stage in um, two years. And that was, it was interesting. It was fun. We had a good time. Uh, Sean Harrison, shout out. We're going to, we're going to be playing at the Whitewater on May 22nd. It's a five o'clock show. You should come out. It's not late. Um, but I realized that, you know, it's like, this is something that a lot of us used to do a lot. We used to be more out there. And part of it is a function of getting older and having more uh, responsibilities and needing more sleep. And 
<laughs> living an adult life. And part of it is just that the culture has changed so that you don't really have to do anything. I mean, sort of like this whole Netflix and chill sort of um, generation, uh, the whole, you know, go home and play video games all night sort of thing. That's 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 alien to me, too, because we used to live our lives on the street, basically, in the 70s and 80s. We were always out. And I don't know. I know that there are people that still go out. I know it's still... There's still a dating culture out there, and there's still a culture where people mix together and um, you know do things. But what I'm wondering about is like so much of our movies and our TVs has, has always taken place in that world that was a common um, space for for most of us i mean we understood what it was like to go to a bar and you know try to meet girls and stuff like that I do, and people aren't if people stop doing that's one less thing that you can have in your movie i mean <laughs> you make everything a period film but if if that's not what people do anymore if people you know sit home and play video games or you know whatever i don't know how you make that cinematic but that's that's beside the point that's a long tangent of um what I was really going to talk to, which is about seeing movies over and over again. Um, I don't do that. I mean, and I think it's okay that if you're somebody who's seen, who likes movies and you watch them again and again and you pick up things every time, yeah, that's fine. That's just one way of watching movies. The way I generally watch movies is I generally turn them on, watch them, react to them. If I write about them, I write about them, and then they're gone. And then, so there are movies that I've totally forgotten over the years. And then there are movies that, you know, you can't, are sort of un, inevitables, is what I call them. And there's, you know, like Animal House, I've probably seen a dozen times. I've seen Citizen Kane probably that many times. The Searchers, a, a few fewer. Hiroshima Mon Amour is one of my films that I really like, and I really like going back to it and in an academic context if I'm lecturing or I'm, you know, talking about a, a film in front of a class, that's one I might rewatch. Same thing with Killer Sheep. That's another sort of academic movie. I mean, I think these are very enjoyable movies on their own, um, by their own lights, but at the same time, it's not like a big popular movie like, say, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which is one of those movies that I think people like to see again and again. But then there are movies you totally forget about, you know, and uh, I... <laughs> I thought I had dreamed this movie. I did not believe this movie actually existed. Okay, well, we have to get here where we don't have the glare from the... Ah, it's pretty... There we go, there we go. The Year of the Jellyfish, which has just come out from Cohen. And I swear, I thought I made this movie up. And uh, if you want a brief synopsis of it, it's basically a Euro trash film set on uh, San Tropez, I believe. San Tropez. I think it's San Tropez. It's a topless beach. And most of the action takes place on the topless beach. And there's a... Uh, Valerie Kapreski is a, a is a young woman who becomes jealous of her mother's friend, or, or becomes a mother's... Yeah, who, who seduces this older man who is... His business is basically providing young women for older men, or something like that. I haven't watched it again. But it's 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 just really trashy and really wonderful. And when it came out in 1984, uh, it was my, before my movie reviewing days. And I'm sure that I didn't think I'd ever think about it again. But I, somehow it got in my head. And then I thought about it later. I go, well, that's preposterous. There could never be a movie like that. I must have dreamed that. I must have thought that up myself. And if I had sat down and I wrote the um, and wrote a script based on my dream, I would have been plagiarizing this. <laughs> I probably wouldn't have got it exactly right. I might have actually altered it enough that it would have been fine legally. <laughs> but it's just such a joy to find this. It's, they sent it to me. I think it comes out... Um, if it's not out now, it's coming out within a week or two. And uh, you're the jellyfish, yeah. I mean, even the title is is really super. Uh, 
it says cult film on here, so that's pretty interesting. It's, uh, you know, um, not a classic of, yeah, it is. It says classics of French cinema, and on the back it says cult. So, you know, I mean, take that for what you will. But, uh, but <laughs> for somebody who hasn't, uh, that, that, that was just a joy to me to find that. Uh, I may have to watch that uh, before we turn it over to the um, charity people that we recycle our DVDs through. So anyway, ah, uh, what else? Oh, uh, you know. I think that's one of the uses of the movies, though, is it's sort of as a this sort of fire starter in your head to, you know, get you thinking about different scenarios and things like that. Uh, I like the movies I concoct in my head that from 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 half remembered plots and little bits of business and scenarios. And this goes into my, the thing I'm always saying, which there's only a couple. If you've seen, if you've been in one of my classes, or you've paid attention to these videos, or read me, you know there's only a couple things I actually say about the movies. I mean, it's like, and the main thing I say, I think, is that nobody sees the same movie as anybody else. That the movie's just there, you know, and you bring whatever you bring to it, and then you complete it. And if you come to it at a different point of your life, you know. You're, you're completing a different film and you're seeing different things and you're picking out different things. We've all had that sensation. It's just that it happens to everybody and all the time. And that means that there's a limited, you know, used to, to saying this is what the movie is because it might not be that for somebody else. Uh, you can use these things any way that you want. You put them out in the, or the creator, the director, puts them out into the universe, and then the universe does things to them. You know, if something survives long enough, it acquires certain qualities that it wouldn't have acquired had it just sat in a vault and nobody seen it for 50 years, you know. And then you get the movie that comes out after 50 years that nobody's seen, and then it has something too that's different and it makes it a different movie than if it had been in the conversation all those years. And I'm thinking about when you calibrate your own taste, your own aesthetic judgment against someone else's, it's really, it's, it can be interesting, but it's not a definitive exercise in, you know, who's right and who's wrong. I, I think about uh, Pauline Kael who is a critic who I love, but I bet if I went through, you know, like her work and, 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 and looked at every movie she saw that I've seen, I bet that more than 50% of the time we would have pretty severe disagreements about the film because we would be seeing a different film. And it's, that's really cool and wonderful. Because what she is doing when she's writing is giving me her version of the film. She's showing me what she saw. And it's not what I saw. I saw this. And that's an exchange that we can have. And it's one of the reasons I really like reading critics. And even people um, who I think are bad critics are sometimes worth attending to, worth paying it some attention to, just because you get somebody who's seen a lot of movies and who can write a little bit, or at least has conned someone into thinking they can write enough to pay them or to publish them at least. And you get these little different versions of these things. You get a, you, you, you get a misconceived version sometimes, a misapprehended version, but it can still be fun can still be wonderful i really <laughs> i really advocate reading as much as you can about the movies if you're a movie buff because it adds to your enjoyment it enhances the experience we're always looking for fresh avenues of delight now thinking about you know like like, like there's a movie like Platoon, 
which is an important movie to me. It's an important movie to me for a couple of reasons. The main reason is because it's the first movie I ever really wrote about professionally. And I wrote about, I've told this story many times, I was sent down to the screening uh, basically to interview the, a group of vets who were going to be watching the movie for the first time. Yeah, it was advanced screening. It was special screening for these guys. And I was going to go down there and talk to them and talk about the experience of seeing the movie with them. And, by the way, as I'm walking out the door, the arts editor says, and since you're going to see this movie in advance, why don't you write up a little review? And it, he said it in a very, dis he didn't mean it. Uh, as a dismissive sort of thing, but that's kind of the way it came off. And uh, I said, okay, sure, how hard can it be? <laughs> and then I get there and I watch Platoon with these vets, these Vietnam War vets, and they are stricken. They are breaking down. They're not, this movie is working on them in ways that's not working on me. I mean, I'm watching a movie and I'm enjoying the movie, okay? I, I like the movie, but these guys are being gut punched by the movie because their experiences were different than my experiences, and because Oliver Stone had had some of the same experiences and had some of the same points of reference as these guys, and he was able to get inside that experience and put it up on the screen in a way that it made sense to them in a way that maybe it might have eluded us that didn't. Um, here's something that uh, Kale wrote about Platoon. Um, I'm going to pull it up here. It's, 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 I know that Platoon is being acclaimed for its realism. I expect to be chastened for being a woman finding fault with a war film. But I've probably seen as much comment combat as most of the men saying this is how war is. Because, of course, people were talking about how realistic Platoon was. Now, I'm in the same situation as Paul and Kale. I, at that point, you know, I, I well, at this point too, I'd never been to war. But the people who were around me, the people who were in that theater with me, the people who I grant some authority on this, had been in the war. And this is how they were affected. And of course, that's going to matter to my review. It's not just about me. It's not just about my reaction. It's about what I can reserve, observe and report. Let's see, Which is one of the problems, I think, that sometimes we have when we watch movies all by ourselves, as critics. Not that... I prefer to watch them in crowded theaters with, you know, what they used to do. I mean, it's been so long since I've been to a screen. Well, not that long. I went to a couple screenings last year, so it's not that that long since I've been to a screening. But, you know, what they want to do is if they, if you, they have a comedy or something, they want to put you in a group of regular people who are happy to have be watching a free movie and are really, you know, primed to laugh at the comedy no matter how stupid the comedy is, and maybe the stupider the comedy, the more they want an audience there. Because if you watch one of those things by yourself, it can get really kind of, kind of a surreal. You know, there's no live, la there's no laugh track. There's a YouTube thing that's like Seinfeld without the, the laugh track. And now you should watch some of these things because it's a totally different feeling you get when you're watching a Seinfeld episode without the laugh track because you get all these awkward pauses and sort of uncomfortable, cringy moments that you don't get in the show that's sweetened. And the main difference between, say, something like uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm and Seinfeld is, aside from the fact that Curb Your Enthusiasm is R-rated, it is that cringiness, is that you don't have a soundtrack in real life. And we're sort of used to the rhythms of the sitcom. And if you take out that filler, that kind of glue from the... <laughs> it really becomes very strange and uncanny and sort of like 
uncomfortable to watch. I mean, watch the Soup Nazi ex, uh, episode without the laugh track. It's really sort of uncomfortable feeling. Anyway, um, what was I? I was, I'd go back to Pauline Kale. I mean, but, you know, sort of, I, I love Kale as a writer. I love her as an observer. Here's something she wrote about, and I got to pull this out too. This is something she wrote about uh, one of my favorite movies, but my wife's absolute favorite movie, Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. And just because it's Karen's favorite movie, don't think bad things about her. Because she's really wonderful. Okay, Kale. At the movies, we are gradually being conditioned to accept violence as a sensual pleasure. The directors used to say they were showing us its real face and how ugly it was in order to desensitize us to its horrors. But you don't have to be very keen to see that they are now, in fact, desensitizing us. They are saying that everyone is brutal. The, he the heroes must be brutal as the villains, or they turn into fools. They are saying there is an assumption that if you are offended by a movie's brutality, you are somehow playing to the hands of people who want censorship. This would deny us who don't believe in censorship the use of the only counterbalance, the freedom of the press to say that there's anything conceivably damaging in these films, the freedom to analyze their implications. If we don't use this critical freedom, we are implicitly saying that no brutality is too much for us, that only squares and people who believe in censorship are concerned with brutality. But actually those who believe in censorship are primarily concerned with sex. And they generally worry about violence only when it's eroticized, which is very, very true. I, I've heard Tommy Smith make the same argument on his morning radio show. And he's absolutely right. And Kale is absolutely right. Back to her. This means that practically no one raises the issue of the possible cumulative effects of movie brutality. Yet surely... When night after night atrocities are served up to us as entertainment, it's worth some anxiety. We become clockwork oranges if we accept all of this pop culture without asking what's in it. How can people go on talking about the dazzling brilliance of movies and not notice that the directors are sucking up to the thugs in the audience? That is still, I mean, let me be very clear. I not only think that Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange is a defensible movie. I think it's a great one. I don't think he's guilty of pandering to thugs. But Kale's point still stands. That you have to call out what you see. And you have to talk honestly about what's going on when you perceive it. And is it something worth thinking about? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because violence, I do think if you see enough violent acts, they desensitize you. If you... Video games are used by the military to desensitize you. To desensitize soldiers, soldiers you know, who are going to be killing other soldiers. You know, it's like, but it's a push-button war now. So basically you acquire a target and you... Delete it. Anyway, uh, I just ran out of time. So we're going to pick this up like maybe next week or something like that because I want to keep continuing talking about, you know, why it's important to think about what you watch. Why it's important to consider what you consume. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you later.